Welcome back to another episode of International Immersion, a podcast that seeks to capture the combined experiences of people, places, culture, traveling, current events, living abroad, and much, much more. For today's episode, I have a very special guest from Myanmar, and he has so so kindly decided to sit down with me today virtually to talk about what is going on in Myanmar and shed more light on a lot of the events and unfortunate circumstances that have led the situation to devolve to where it is now. I actually talked to him back in May on a previous episode when things were still early on and the protests and other uh, resistance was kind of peaceful resistance methods were still going on. But unfortunately, since then, things have really taken a downturn and a lot more has developed. So uh, it's great to have you back on. First and foremost, I'm glad to hear that you're safe and you're doing well from the last time we talked, despite the circumstances. So I just want to thank you so much for being on with me t- today. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very delighted to be here. And thank you for the invitation. It's been a lot for me to talk about Myanmar. Well, I'm, I, yeah, and we're, we're, it's a pleasure to have you. And, you know, it's just Hearing, um, talking to you last time was just, you know, very sobering, but also very informative what was going on. So I'm really interested to see what's been going on. And I've heard that you've had to move from the city to where you are now um, in the another, another part of the country where it's safer for you. So that's good that you've been able to relocate without too much problem. So to begin with, let's, um, for everyone's kind of re- reference, Maybe you could tell a little bit about Myanmar, your country, and a little bit of the background that's kind of led up to what's happened now. Well, I think Myanmar got international attention since the persecution of the Rohingya. So Myanmar is a member of South Asian nation and is located right exactly between China and India. And Myanmar is composed of many ethnic many diverse ethnic groups, and each of them have their own unique culture, custom, tradition, and language as well. So I myself belong to one of the minority group called Kachin, and the vast majority are Buddhists and the ethnic group are called Burma. And I think the Myanmar got, Myanmar never got a single year of peace after we get into, even after we get independent from uh, British in uh, uh, <clears throat> 1948. So I think Myanmar has always been in a very complex issue it seems like diversity, it's a problem in Myanmar. Yeah, that is one thing that's been consistent in the news is just that the, the cultural and ethnic diversity is amazing. But at the same time, it's also been a huge source of contention between the groups and majority versus the minorities. And then at the same time, Myanmar has a very rich history. It's, you know, it has a very long history. It used to be a very powerful empire that you know, rivaled the, the Qing. And there were several wars fought against the Qing in the, seven, in the 18th century. And then, like you said, eventually the British colonized uh, Myanmar, and then it was granted independence in 1948, and then it became independent. And then, unfortunately, not long after, the military became, took control, and it's basically been in control since the 1960s, if, if I'm not mistaken. And that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, so then, but yeah, I mean, the other thing is just, I've heard, you know, it's a very beautiful country. There's a lot of, you know, it's very rich culturally. So what's going on now is just saddening because that's been basically turned on its head. And, you know, beforehand, I saw some YouTubers and other people who visited there. It was really neat. But unfortunately, now that's really kind of passed for at least the immediate future. So, mm. so moving on, let's, um, so we know that the, the, there's the elections at the end of last year. Uh, in 2020. And then on February 1st, the military launched a coup, which, ups- which you know, overturned the, the democratic government. And they basically took control when you do a referendum, but that's really not gone anywhere. And they're probably, it's tr- probably not going to happen. So, you know, and, and from our last time we talked, you know, that sparked a huge amount of protests, which, which quickly devolved into a lot of other problems. So maybe in a nutshell, could you kind of explain as an eyewitness what's happened from the coup up until now? So, you know, getting close to a year. Mm. Yes, I think, Sean, as you have said earlier, that what happened in in Myanmar is a real tragic 
And I'm extremely sad what is going on because I was so excited, right? I mean, last year I was in the United States and seeing that democracy in action. I was very excited. I want to bring that values in. And I and I did. And I had trained what I call kind of driven leadership to, you know, hundreds of students. But now what happened is just, 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 just. That's why I think the uh, February uh, first coup still came as a root shock to all of us. So I think I really want to bring you three phases, what I call three phases. First phase is called a silent phase because nobody, nobody because we were shocked, right? I mean, I mean we, we were encouraged to stay at home because of the COVID. We are dealing with COVID in Myanmar. It's a very poor country, one of the poorest nation on earth. So we are dealing with coping with COVID, coping with poverty, you know, coping a lot of stuff. And then this came in. So first of all, it's what I call silent face. So we don't know what to do. We were shocked. Everybody, and, and more important, I still remember on that very first coup day, and then we everybody lost their connection. You cannot connect to the internet. You can even call your cell phone. Everything is disconnected. We are disconnected. So silent face, we really don't know what to do, what is going on. But, and then, after that, what I call awakening phase. Oh my goodness, we, we must do something about it, right? So for the, particularly, I really give all those credits to the Generation Z, who was very young, who was a teenager. They got very upset. They, they are not interested in politics. They don't care what is going on around the world. What they care is just a game. But now they say, oh my God, my future has been taken away. I must do something about it. And then we don't have any leading figure. For instance, in 1988, right, when the Nobel Prize for Laura Dosu, she was the leading figure. But for this revolution, none of, none of the politicians leading this movement. Everybody take up that moral call. And then we think that we must do something about it. Even the Rohingya people, they say, oh my God, we must do something about for this nation as well. They take up, they say, I'm Rohingya, I'm against this military coup. So everybody's, you know, take up this moral calling. Has, <clears throat> we are very united. We were, you, you know what, we were very united. We are extremely disciplined, you know. During that, I still remember, you know, hundreds of thousands of, you know, uh, people came up it's across the nation i mean across the nation i was in yangon but i see through the social media people were extremely united let's say tomorrow please come and you know assembly this area and thousands of people came up like that this is called what i call awakening phase protest has become a bread and butter for us and the third phase is called violent phase you know what if you are hungry, if you are thirsty, and there will be a food for you, because during that protest, they will say, please do something for, thank you for doing something for our nation in this very, you know, uh, a very sunny day like that. So people are encouraging each other, people are inspiring each other, people are, you know, giving, you know, uh, hope each other like that. And then suddenly, I still remember that in the capital city of Myanmar, there's a 19 years old girl. She was just you know, protesting, but she was just uh, uh, under the tree, right? And then she, she was leaning on a car because it, it was very hot and there was protest. They would just have a, a little bit of break. And then that uh, so-called, you know, so-called the security forces shoot her right away. And then it, it, it's brought our anger. And then the next day, thousands of people showed up for a final well, final fairway. And then we were showing this three finger salute and we said, okay, we're gonna fight until we fight this fight. We, 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 this, you know, fight is over like that. And then so from that day on, I see the uh, uh, first year medical grad, uh, medical student got shot and another teacher got shot. They don't care which professional you belong to. They don't care whether you are young or old or whether you are even a, a peaceful protest protester. You know, one just six year old girl, little girl, she was just, you know, staying at her home, you know, playing around with her daddy. The security forces came in her house and shoot her. So, I mean, that's what I call a violent face. From that day on, now everybody have to, everybody have to run away. And myself has run. I have to run because no, no way is safe in Myanmar. And that is exactly what happened. What I call silent face, awakening face, and now the violent face. 
from that day on still they killing everybody and they had really turned our nation into what I call a slaughterhouse. You know, that's just so sorrowing to hear and to think that they can be so indiscriminate on that, especially when people are not protesting violently. They're just simply expressing themselves. And then all of a sudden, you don't know if you're going to be shot or beaten or arrested or disappeared. That is just, that's horrifying. And that's just, you know, so, so saddening because like you said, these Gen Zers, you know, the younger generation, they weren't really into politics. It's the same in a lot of places, but when your future, your livelihood and your ability to, you know, have a, have a, you know, maybe a, a, a life or have, you know, what any human being should be able to aspire to do or to be is threatened, you know, that shows a lot of, you know, conciliation and also just, you know, hey, we're all threatened. So it's just more of a spontaneous thing they did. And that's just, that's very uh, motivating. But at the same time, it's very sad because they've used, the, the military has used such force and you know, and, you know, violence against them, including you, because I know you've been in some of the protests and you've seen some pretty graphic things happen to people, which is just, you know, no one should have to see that or even, in, or experience that. Exactly, exactly, yes, exactly. And that leads into the next thing, you know, which we've kind of already, you know, you've already really <laughs> opened the lid to, to an extent mm -hmm. is, you know, what is the military doing to the population? Because from following the news, at first they were, more monitoring, then they started breaking things up, then they were spent, then like in the capital, they started using more violent means. And then now, but from what I've heard now that it's even gotten worse, they're, they're using even more, uh, more violent or lethal force here, if, that, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and uh, yes, I, I mentioned a few things, but I really, if I have to summarize with one word, that would be a very classic a textual example of any dictatorship would do it's you know creating a climate of fear if you do something as this is what i am capable of like that by killing our peaceful protester you know i mentioned even you are stayed at home or you know whether you are outside you know taken on the street they don't really care they will just shoot everywhere in a broad daylight even at night as well right so and then even last week uh, there is a local uh, local news report that and a mother of newly baby born, you know, she got raped repeatedly the whole night by uh, three, you know, soldiers. I don't want to call them even the soldiers. They are not a soldier. They are just uh, rapists and murderers, you know. And, and the other thing is that when, you know, after that, you know, huge, uh, massive, you know, protest, and then uh, we got a, the Tatar Gobi, we came in, it's really hit hard the people of Myanmar. You know, a lot of people need oxygen. So people have to queue for that. But the military didn't allow for people who need oxygen like that. So it's, it's, it's you know, somehow I can't even breathe. You know, that time a lot of COVID happened in India as well. So in Myanmar, a lot of kids rise up and they really use oxygen as a weapon, you know, to to intimidate its people and to create a climate change like that. So, and uh, now just, just last a couple of days ago, the military announced that uh, people are not wear, people are uh, not allowed to wear masks because they said they, they wanna check in. So imagine even this is a COVID area, we, you know, we still have to cope with COVID and still you are not allowed to wear masks in public. What kind of stupid is uh, 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 gov I don't want to call it government. What kind of stupid is that? You know what I'm saying? So this is what they have done to has been, I mean, uh, doing to its very own people that they say that they want to protect. But in our observation, they are not protecting us. They're just killing us one by one. And last but not least, I think the bank systems as well. Now, a lot of aid organizations, for instance, I myself work for the BC Media Action. It's a charitable organization as well. But what happened is that a lot of my, uh, uh, they, they stopped a lot of the project because we don't have the cash. Because you are allowed only to uh, withdraw, I think, uh, maximum 200 US dollar per week. So we don't have catch, we don't have catch, we don't have, you know, oxygen and uh, we don't have safety. We don't have anything. This is what they have done to us. I hate them, you know. 
Well, I wouldn't, uh, I'd be a little, I'd be a little surprised if you didn't <laughs> hate, have disdain or anything for any type of entity that would do that to its own people and used, you know, terror tactics, you know, you know, indiscriminate murder, rape, you know, things like that. That's, you know, textbook oppression and terror tactics, in, you know, in a nutshell. But, mm. you know, it's just sickening. It just, you know, makes me want to literally, you know, makes me, makes me sick to my stomach just hearing this because, yeah, you hear about this, but when you hear from someone like you who, in, in, in a number of ways has experienced it firsthand, it's just, it's, it's, it's reviling to say the least. And that, you know, that leads to our next point is, you know, you know, why have protest, why have the peaceful protesters in many cases decided to take up arms? Because I did see some reports a while back, a lot of protesters had fled into the rebel areas of different, different um, uh, ethnicities or uh, minorities that had, had armed unit, armed wings that had been fighting the military for decades. And a lot of protesters have now been joining them to receive training because they want to be, basically take the fight back to them. That wasn't an initial goal, but from watching some interviews with them, you know, via news and stuff, they're just saying that, you know, they don't want to, li- they don't want their future taken away. Like you said. Yes. Yes. I, uh, you know, that's what, as far as, as I had mentioned earlier that we cry for help, right? I think, uh, for instance, you know, every day, right? Let's say uh, today, let's, let's go and protest there in front of the uh, American embassy. And then uh, we, we, we really allocate uh, different group in different embassy. Please help Myanmar. Please, you know, do something else for Myanmar. But, and they couldn't stop. Uh, they never stopped killing us, you know, the, the, the military. So, yes, of course, there are a lot of state that came in from the international community. And then we, the, the, the Generation Z, realized that, oh, my God, we must do something about it. You know, statements are very good. But it's, it's oh, my goodness, I remember, oh, oh, you know, United States had released this one. And then we shared together. We even changed our profile, you know. Uh, of oh, this America has said something like that and UK has said something like that and we are very encouraging and actually that really uh, motivate us that oh my god our, our voices has heard like that but in a ground on a ground level right so people are stuffing we have seen I have seen with my own eye the 19 year old boy got shot you know on his head but he's still alive like that I was holding his hand and cried the whole night it seems like I, I was hoping, you know, everybody, you know, this is a, such a Buddhist country and they say, oh, you prayed to your Buddhist and I pray to Christian and somebody prayed to your Allah that we all, you know, cry to each and every one of their God. And later on, you know, it's, he just gone like that. So that's a, you know, somebody who love peace, who love justice, you know, who want future. And we know that we don't want to live under this murderous uh, military council regime because there is no future, there is no justice for us. So at the end, there is only one option left, right? Since they have got gone. So we must do something about it. And then now the many, you know, Oscars politicians, right? A member of the civil disobedient movement, like, you know, medical doctor or teacher or student, and everybody really gone to the jungle and where they get, as you mentioned, they, they really get the military training. And, and now what we call after this, what we call now, we have this people defense force. In the short, we call it PDF. And uh, they are goaded to protect and defend people and their property from, from, from harming by the uh, military councils like that. So, and the reason we take on because, not because uh, we want to reverence, but we've, we, we believe in uh, justice. We believe that we must do something about it. And we have that responsibility to do something about it. That's why we call it even people defense. We have we must defend our right. We must defend our people because uh, so called the army they are not protecting us. We must protect ourselves like that. So why we decided because we have no option left because the pro there is no progress uh, when. Uh, but at the same time, young people still they protest peacefully in a uh, gorilla style. But at the same time, we the people, the 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 PDF, they get military training and then they attack some of the uh, some of the posts. We want to remind it, you know, uh, you in order to weaken and uh, fears. I'm uh, sorry, in order to weaken the uh, the uh, strongholds. And the other part, what, what we have been doing is that it's really good that 
the and uh and what we call the defection some of the uh, uh captain now he's quite uh quite uh well known in Myanmar now he kept, what they call it the the he organized what we call people soldiers right so he uh he really uh encouraged other his comrade you know to, to do that defection and 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 uh follows uh the people desire and people will like that so yeah i did see so, i mm. did see some you know, that a decent number of both soldiers and police you know basically defected or fled because as they as some of them inter were interviewed when they they fled to india or some other places they literally just said i could no longer do you know you know kill or you know hurt my own people it's like they hit they, they was like you know and they just couldn't you know, it's just like anyone it's like you, your conscience won't let you at a certain point even if you're ordered to do something like that it's just like in your heart you know that's not right yeah but no i i, I i'm so sorry you had to deal with that when that you know you had mm. you guys witness someone you know die from a gunshot wound you know and trying to save his life that's i'm so sorry you had to go through that that i can't even fathom how bad that is or how awful that must have been but you know and my my deep fear is that you know things could continue to escalate because you know there are a lot of armed entities in Myanmar and, and this is just going to fuel resistance and like you said at the end of the day you don't want more violence but you you know we all have a right to defend ourselves you know and if they're intent on using lethal force sometimes that's all you have in response which is horrible to say but it's just the truth Mm. And then, you know, at the same time, you know, that leads, you know, kind of building on that is, you know, what would you say would be the best way, you know, to resist what the uh, junta has done now? Like, you know, mm. like, what do you think are the best or like, what do you think would be the best ways or ways that, you know, protesters, the citizens, because I know there's a civil disobedience movement trying to like, you know, we're not working, we're not going to do anything, we're not going to support anything while, while you're doing this. But I mean, those are just some things I've, I've seen being there on the ground. What would you say be the best ways to resist at this point? Mm, I, uh, I've been thinking a lot about it. And uh, I think it's, 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 it's very interesting to see that the, what we know that the, uh, the, um, you know, the military are so capable of killing people, right? I mean, women got raped, villages are burned and kids are running, right? But at the same time, for outside the people, right, who, um, when you compare to military government and the, the people, right, it's like uh, uh, David and Goliath, right? Because even though we are PDF, we don't have any weapon, where you gonna get, get this, uh, um, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the gun and everything like that, the equipment, right? But we still, you know, everybody's doing their job. In Yangon, I see that people still, they said, okay, we don't, the feminist group called out, they said, okay, we don't want it. We don't want this rapist, rapist uh, military regime. Once they got the news that, that the mother of newly baby born was straight like that. And the other day in Mandalay, and then a lot of the LGBT, right? They said that even in, uh, they said, even, I mean, in, in, in our own time, they said, if in conservative terms, right, the LGBT, so-called the gay, homo, uh, homosexual, they, they regard as somebody who's weak like that. But they say, even though I'm weak physically, as you think, but I'm strong, you know, I'm not afraid of that military regime. So what I'm trying to say, everybody's doing their job. So I think we must do what we can as an individual or, you know, as a, you know, collective action like that. So I, re but I really want to give four areas, right? I think now we got, three bivocal forces, what I call. First, the National national Unity Government, NUG, or uh, Committee Representative Piran Luto, CRPH. They are the uh, comprised of, you know, outcast elected politicians. They are the one they, they were elected, you know, the previous election, right? So mm -hmm. now we got this government and then our everybody, I mean, 50 million people, this really represent us. And then another is CDM. Still, they are the civil servant, but decided not to work for this murderous regime. And the third is uh, the Gen CJ or PDF, right? They are still 
uh, defending people and they, they attack some uh, important uh, poses. So what we can do now is that on a diplomatic front, the the NUG is tried to NUG is tried to tell international community that we are the legitimate government, not the military council. So accept us as a you know le legitimate government. That's a, a diplomatic front. So in the military front, right now we got the PDF. They are the right wing of the the national unity of government. So they have that uh, view, uh, strategy plan how to weaken the military. And the third one is the economy front. Now the NUG is selling bonds, right? Uh, where you can just, just within a few hours, they just started last, uh, just a couple of days ago, this program, within an hours, and then they have received uh, the 9 million uh, US dollar, but you cannot buy the Myanmar dollar, right? So uh, they, they are selling, uh, sell, selling it, you know, across the nations. A lot of uh, the uh, uh, Myanmar people from, you know, abroad, they really, I mean, wholeheartedly support this, uh, uh, support this program. And on the digital front, and now people, if you live in Myanmar, now, now what well, I have to say, I you, you got to use two accounts, right? One is you have to Facebook account. Now you have to connect with your friends like that. The other account, you it's where you can share news like that now if you are in a city area you will stop by police then they're gonna check your facebook and then if you share something related to that they're gonna arrest you so on a digital front we are still you know fighting as well you know posting that's why you know sometimes we we take for granted but now i really 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 understand the the, the, the you know the freedom is Freedom is not free, you know, even posting something on, you cannot post anything what you want. So what I'm trying to say is that on a digital front as well, please mention about Myanmar. And just uh, yesterday, my friends from Japan, she said, oh my, as far as I see a lot of news in Japan, but now I don't hear anything. I thought, you know, it, 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 it seems like that's a good progress. But I shared this, you know, uh, rape story. She said, oh my God, so I didn't know that there was still, happening unlike that. So please on a digital front and, and share about this news and which is not good news, but I think it's really helped that, you know, we are not in a stable condition. So I think I, I, I mentioned a lot, so, but- No, yeah. no, 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 very well said. And like you said, basically they're trying to set up basically an alternative government that's in their mind legitimate based on what the people's wishes are and what they really want. And like you said, they have the, you know, the government side where you have command control authority, you have the economic side and you have, you know, the, the self-defense force or people self-defense force, which is kind of, you know, in, in a nutshell, more the armed side for protection to try to counter the military. But like you said, the biggest issue is just the, the David and Goliath in terms of just what the military is capable of doing at this point versus, you know, the average citizenry, which is at a huge disadvantage, but, you know, and then, like you said, you know, the one big difference between now and like the late 1980s is that social media and the ability to disseminate information is so much better, which is a huge advantage. And that's not even just Myanmar, that's in a lot of countries that have go through things like this. They're able to get more information out. Even back in the Arab Spring, people from those countries were sharing on Facebook and, and other social media platforms. And that really demonstrates the power of social media. And like you said, that's the reason why the government is so adamant on trying to, you know, basically control that. Like you said, they cut the internet, cut, you know, bit and cut signal and other thing just to prevent that from coming out because they know that and in many cases is the most damaging to them. Mm -hmm. And, but yeah, like you said, that that's horrifying in that you could be arrested or detained or even worse just because something for speaking your mind and posting something that's, that's, that's awful. And, you know, and something that, no one should have to worry about because you know you should be able to express yourself you know and but you know and like you said i think it's important to do that but you know in your situation you know just please take care of yourself and you know mm -hmm. do what you can to avoid any unnecessary attention but yeah, i think it's really good that you're doing what you're doing now mm. so, but no i mean just <clears throat> think the things that they're doing it it doesn't <laughs> doesn't take much to think Oh, why are the people resisting? Oh, they should be resisting because if 
you know, if an armed group came into my area and started killing people and doing things, I wouldn't be uh, doing nothing. I would be doing at least something to try to stop it. I mean, that's just, <laughs> I think that's yeah. kind of common sense. Mm-hmm. And then that leads on to the next point that I want to bring up, which you've also kind of touched upon is, you know, how should the international community help try to mitigate the situation and, you know, trying to prevent the violence you know, and the atrocities which are taking place. You, know, you mentioned like the, you know, the statements, the support of the UN and other things, but like you said, it's good, it's good but it's not enough. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I, I really, I, I, uh, well, a lot of international friends, they generally want to know, so how can I help you? What's the best way to help? So I really come up with, I think, four areas. First is, uh, as I said, the diplomatic when you talk about you know fight, it's not just a fight you know with gun and gun. It's it, it, it in in lot of front, right? So in a diplomatic front, please accept the NUG, what we what, what, national unity government, accept as our legitimate government because that they they are comprised of a lot of ethnic group, you know, and they try to bring everybody together in. And the good news is that they try to you know accept Rohingyas as well. I think in in a the previous government, right? You are not even allowed to go Rohingya. They say, oh, they are from Bangladesh and Bengali like that. But now the NUG, this is just the Rohingya case, everybody know, you know, that that's one, I bring up this one. And they say that we're going to accept the ethnic groups as well, you know, so that was just very good. So they are really doing good, good, they're doing with good intention. Now they know that it is critical. So accept on a diplomatic friend. And as a legitimate government, and what they're doing is uh, greater good for our people. On the military front, I'm not quite sure whether people can have us militarily, but on a military front, and they are doing what they can, the, uh, the PDF. So uh, I'm not saying that you, you, you can help directly, you know, all the weapon and stuff like that. But I think on the military front, what you can do, like a defection strategy, right? like how you can really defend yourself like that. And that would be really helpful. And on the economy front, please stop working with this murder military council. If you know some big company, right? So sometimes you have to, you have to choose that, 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 you know, moral causes and, 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 and legal. Sometimes we talk about whether it's illegal or illegal. We never talk about whether we are lawful city or not. I think we should be really, you know, take our moral calling and stop working with this, uh, military uh, military uh, council because all the money that they got it they were directly directly going to shooting its own people so and last uh, we have been calling all those big big uh, um, uh, international co- uh, company to stop working with uh, military council and one company from Australia and we even sent uh, we get a lot of signatures to the Parliament of the Australia. And as I said, the last would be the digital front. And uh, still, you can really spread our, you know, the plight of our people, uh, of the plight of the people of Myanmar. And digital front is very, very, very effective. As I think you have already mentioned as well. I think, please, that's why I think just last uh, couple of days ago, uh, American journalist, he was released. And because there was some uh, uh, negotiation between the military council and there's a, the uh, former governor of the United States, and he they came in. At first, he was sentenced. To, he was uh, sentenced to prison for uh, for thirteen years, like that. And then now he got released because and 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 then he said, "What are you gonna do?" He said, "I will do what I can because journalism is not a crime, you know." And then he will keep reporting. He said there are a lot of people who are suffering in the prison. So, uh, diplomatic fronts, military front, economic front, and uh, digital fronts. So. Uh, there are plenty of things that uh, each and every one can can do. Yeah, it's like by its you know by themselves, one is they're impactful, but not as much as when they're all working together. And, you know, mm-hmm. and that's another thing that I found interesting is I'm not sure how true it is, but I know that a lot a lot of the uh, the different you know minorities, some of the armed armed rings. Armed, armed groups from each one that have been resisting, they've been working more together and they've also been working more with the protesters, as I mentioned earlier. So there's been more, I don't know how much collaboration there is, but I, but do you think that that's going to cause a lot of the min- minorities to work cl- more closely together? 
you know what? Minority has been very close together more than ever because we understand the suffering. You know what? It's very interesting for, for this, uh, because of this what we call revolution, the vast majority are Burma and Buddhists, right? So they never experienced like that when you talk about rape case. We understand it because just uh, 2000, uh, I forget the exact year, but there was two Kachin uh, teachers. They got raped and the Kachin, the entire Kachin was very sad and upset. But for some, some people on the city area, they was just like, oh, this is just happening in the you know, rural area like that. But now there was a, oh my God, they shoot us in the city on a broad daylight. How many people, they all the shot when the ethnic area and the people are in a jungle where they can access the internet where where they can you know express themselves like that so so minority has been very united and you might uh you you might real you might aware that even when the state council those when she defend uh uh the, the military at the uh icg right the national criminal court and you will see that the vast majority they said we support, you know, those who. But on the other hand, you see a lot of ethnic group coming together and against her. Not because, not, uh, we're not against her personally, right? But we're against uh, who's somebody who's going to defend, who is undefendable, right? Undefensible, this military, this military that committed crime against humanity. So you see that the minority has been united ever. And but now the majority joined to our causes because they said, "Oh my God, we didn't know." That's why a lot of my friends, a lot of my friends, the Burma friends, everybody was said. So <clears throat> I'm sorry that you guys has been suffering like that. But now I know that we have been lie. You know, they, the military are very good at playing the religious and uh and racial identity card. You know, which is very powerful, which is very sensitive. So I work for the BD Media Action. My my project is for social cohesion, which is very sensitive. We always, 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 you know, got attacked like that. So yes. You know, and like you said, it all comes down to awareness. And you know, mm. uh, you know, as, as the one adage goes, you know, out of sight, out of mind. If you don't really see it or are exposed to it, it's hard to like, oh, is it? You know, but once you once you experience it yourself, or you know someone yeah. who, who experiences something then that changes everything it's like you know you know a, you know a switch flipping in a way and it is you know and i just hope that you know the you know the self defense force and the, and the new and the basically uh opposition government as you can call it continues to gain more strength and you know the people of myanmar can get what they really want because it's very mm. clear they want you know democracy they want they want the right to control their own destiny which they're being mm. denied now. And that kind of leads on to my next point. And this is more, I think, speculative at this time. But what do you think the outcome will be? Because, you know, this has been going on for about a year now. And unfortunately, I don't mm. think it's going to end anytime soon. That's just my my personal hypothesis. But being there, what do you, what do you foresee or, or potentially can predict? Mm. Mm, uh it's, I think I, I mentioned earlier as well that people are very united now, the majority, minority. Now we don't have a majority, minority. Now we don't have Rohingya like that. We said, okay, we see that humanity, right? You know, because of COVID and we are one, what we want. We all want justice. We all want justice must be served. Justice, you know, something must be done like that. So I think unity had emerged. I think that's a very good one. I think the unit, national unity government, they must use this one, you know, uh, because uh, I mean, that's, a, that, 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 that's very good. People understand now, the, let, let's say the ethnic armed group, right? In the past, like, why they have been fighting? Now say, oh my God, I understand why they have been fighting for decades. So I think first of all, it's unity have emerged. The humanity have emerged. And the empathy have emerged. I think that's a very good one. I think that's a very full step because Myanmar, as I said from the very beginning, Myanmar is very diverse. Diversity is issue. But now, if we diverse and understand each other, I think they will become a very powerful strength, you know, to do everything what we want to do first. 
and 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 the second is on a digital front or so i mean diplomatic front i see that now in south korea and czech republic now they have their own uh like kind of the embassy where people can work together and it seems that the Czech republic and south korea that we're gonna work closely with this uh with this you know, uh, uh, group that represent that NUG national gov national unity government like that. So on a diplomatic front, uh, we get a lot of uh, progress. We have seen it just yesterday, and the China decided not to uh, decided not to invite not to invite the uh, military represented from the military council to attend that ASEAN China meeting. Now you've seen the China doing it, China the, the right thing now, and and like that and then even the in terms of climate change the uh arranged by the harvard harvard university and the other lot of um climate area they really invite one of the uh natural resources minister from uh national unit of government so on a diplomatic front we see a lot a lot of huge progress now on the military front and uh on the military front well, as I said, technically it will be like a, a you know David and Goliath, but but now what happened is that the arm um, ethnic group they they are doing what what they can the best. They they give that uh, military training to everybody who have you know committed you know to defend their own people like that. So on the military front, they are very united. But still, you know, it, technically speaking, let's say if all the ethnic group united to kind of fight against this one, it is possible. Well, what I would tell you one figure: we none of the ethnic area have the military, I mean, the the uh, death flag. So, uh, which means just lots of in 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 area that I am living now is in two thousand eleven, when they are when they are very when they decided to do that massive attack, what they used that uh, jack. Uh, oh, airstrikes. So they used air strike. air, airstrikes. Yes. And, okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, still, uh, technically speaking, that's a huge difference, right? We are David and they're Goliath. But the thing is that you have, we really have to use our brain because no, not even for the military, they have never uh, experiences, you know, uh, a fight in a city area. Right where you have that, you know, uh, 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 general public. If you are fighting in a jungle area, you know, there, there's nobody, only two people like that. So it's 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 a, a so what I'm trying to say is that in a military front, you you cannot overestimate, you know, what military can do and underestimate what the the people defense force can do because the battlefield is different now. Exactly. So you're saying basically the balance of power, you, you know. Between the two, between the two, you know, of course, is shifting, and also, you know, fighting in a jungle or a natural environment is very different from city because, historically speaking, city fighting has been always been the bloodiest and the most vicious because of the nature of, you know, how an urban area is laid out versus the jungle. So, mm. and like you said, when they did that back in 2011, they mainly used, you know, air power or artillery. They didn't really, you know, they they basically did more things from afar, from afar, indirect. Mm. So, you know, I just, and I hope to God they don't do anything like a massive offensive into your area or something like that, because that would be disastrous. But, you know, that's my biggest concern is that, you know, I'm it hoping is, yeah. that the people can get what they want, but I'm very sorrowful and, you know, you know, a bit, you know, worried about how many people will not survive that. Yes. Yes. That, that is my, my first, uh, concerns as well. You know, let, let's say, I mean, let's say if you arrested, some of my friends has been arrested and, and some has been released like that, and some are extremely tortured. But at least you get some hope. But you know, once you got killed with you know massive you know bombing up stuff, that's the thing that that's the last thing that I really you know don't want to see like that. So no, and who 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 wants to endure mm -hmm. that or eat yeah, more yeah. or any of that? That's no, that's just, that's just awful. And, you know, I, like I said, I just, you know, continuously, you know, hope for your safety and, and for your well being along with any, everyone, your family and everyone else, you know, in your area, because I know you're in an area, more of a rural area now, uh, in more than mm -hmm. north of the country now. So, I mean, 
kind of wrapping up for the evening, you know, kind of summing up, what would you say, like, you know, you can break this down any way you want. What are your final thoughts, hopes, and what do you want the outside or people outside of Myanmar to know? Mm. And uh, one thing that I want to mention is that since April, right, the United Nations has uh, estimated that you know, over 3 million will, will, will face hunger because of the COVID, because of the coup. Now I see in this jungle, I see thousands of uh, 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 starving children. I mean, they're really starving. So, so my final thought would be, please uh, uh, pray for us. I mean, that's the things that we can do. And the other thing, if you know somebody from Myanmar, please, you know, text them or email them or call them or send them an email or that, oh, so I, I remember you, you know, or hey, so-and-so, uh, what's going on in Myanmar is such a tragic and uh, I pray for you. I think that's, that, that's, that's so powerful. I really, really do. Now I'm talking with you and, and it's, it's mean a lot. I really mean because we feel like we are disconnected. We feel like we are, what, what, what situation and we feel like nobody understand us, right? And we are already forgotten people. That's exactly what we've been feeling, the people of Myanmar. But if you know somebody from Myanmar, please tell them that uh, I'm just, I, I, I remember you like that. That would be really good. And for instance, I will just give you one example. Just last couple of days ago, uh, the deputy mayor of Los Angeles, where I was working for the Los Angeles mayor as a fellow, and she, she, she sent an email that Zor, what's happened in Myanmar, it's not progressing. And I remember you and let me know, uh, you know what, what she can help. And it, it means a lot. You know, I almost cry because she's so busy. When I was in the LA, I know that how busy she were, but she take the time and write an email. It, it means a lot. So please take, you know, a moment of, you know, one or two and then talk to them. They will, that, that's really give them courage to move forward because in Myanmar, right? We're talking daily about how struggle we are. We see the struggling people, starving people. And then, and then uh, Sean, what you're doing, it's, it, it's, it's, you might seem that it's, we're just talking, but it's very impactful. I would say it's, it's, I'm, I'm very grateful and I will never forget what, what, what you do to me personally. I really appreciate it. Likewise, everybody will be appreciated. It's really give us hope. And, uh, and the other thing is, that particularly if you live in a democratic country and, and the elected uh, government, they truly represent you. They will listen to your voices, right? So, and please tell, if you are in your, in your constituents and tell them that uh, what's going on in Myanmar, if my friends live there, right? what's going on in Myanmar, you should pay attention like that. At least talk about it, right? And, I think there will be something good because you use your right, right? You use your uh, your given uh, right, you know, to to express other people and tell them that you, you are in solitary with us like that. That would be really good. And uh, the other thing is that now we really need human training aids as well. So I think to support the, the, the organization that they are already doing in other countries, I, I think in in United States, there are a lot of Myanmar groups as well, where they have interacted with people. If you know somebody, enjoy with them, right? If you're protest, if you are available, enjoy with them and and help them. And let's do what we can. And my biggest biggest figure is that before we before they you know kill mass of people, let's stop there. Let's unite it together. And uh let's do what we can at the end of the day, you know, and the COVID teach a lesson that uh, whether you, in, in, in any way, you know, we are, we are one as humanity. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that, that, that's all I wanna say, yeah. I'm no, just very, 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 very well said, I will say that. And I think mm -hmm. you really bring the fact it's the human element, just the connection between people. That really is the most important thing. Just, you know, having someone reach out to you and ask, Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm supportive. Hey, you know, you need to talk that I think that is the, one of the most important things just, you know, from person to person, you know, just the, the, the knowing that the fact that someone cares, respects, or 
even just, you know, it simply just thinks of you, you know, they don't just, oh yeah, they actually take the time to reach out. Hey, how's it going? Just the act of reaching out, I think is just, you know, quintessential, you know, and I know for you, like you said, it gives you that extra energy and motivation to keep going and to do what you do. And, you know, and just listening to you and hearing about a lot of the horrible things you've discussed, it just motivates me to, you know, tell more stories like this and raise more awareness about what is going around in the world. Because at the end of the day, like you said, we're all one. We may have, we may look different. We may do different things, but at the same day, we're all human. And we all, in, at least in some ways, want the same things, you know, you know, life, liberty, happiness, you know, the ability to pursue and enrich our lives and make the, make the you know, the world and the situation better for our children and successors, in, you know, in a, in a mm-hmm. nutshell. So I just want to say, I really appreciate the time. I'm unfortunate. And again, I'll say it again and again, I'm just glad you're safe. And, you know, my heart goes out to everyone in Myanmar. I, you know, I just hope the situation can be dealt with. And I just want the, the violence and the loss of life to, you know, desist as soon as possible, because it's just a tragedy because, mm. you know, they're like every place, every country has so much potential and to see it being basically like, you know, you know, stonewalled like this is just, you know, it's, it's just disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, well, I'm just saying, you know, and kind of to top it off, I think the one thing that I really take away is just the resilience that you and mm. your fellow, you know, um, you know, Burmese, as we say, or, you know, or, you know, you know, citizens of Myanmar demonstrate is just, you know, is just amazing. And at the same time, hearing the things that have happened, like, you know, people being randomly shot, you know, when they're being raped, uh, you know, people disapp- being disappeared or, you know, arrested or, you know, even executed in some cases, which I'm sure is happening that we don't know about. Mm. Or, and then also, you know, the prospect of escalation of armed conflict, I think that needs, people need to know that to realize, you know, if they're in a place like here in the U S they, they realize, yeah, things can be bad things are, are, but Hey, you know, things can always get worse and you need to cherish, like you said, cherish mm-hmm. the freedoms and the abilities you have. Yeah. And that's my hope for people in Myanmar to gain those things back in the future. So, mm. but no, I just, you know, I really appreciate the, th- the thoughts, you know, it's really, you know, it's a bit, um, you know, r- rough to hear about this, but these are stories that have to be told in my opinion. Mm. Exactly, exactly. And what you're doing is the right thing. And thank you for doing that. And uh, again, again, I mean, I really, really appreciate it. I would say thank you in person. And uh, hopefully that day will come very soon, Sean. Likewise, likewise. Mm. That'd be great. We can meet back in person again, like we did in the past. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. Under better circumstances, for sure. Yes, yes, yes. Please, yeah. Well, again, I really appreciate it. You know, it's been a great, it's been great catching up to you and just hearing what you had to say, despite the negativity and, you know, the situation you're experiencing. So, you know, like I said, my continued hope is for you to be, to be, continue to be safe, your friends, the family to make, be safe and to be in a situation where you're not constricted or, you know, being forced to reside where you are for your own safety. So, you know, that's my hope. And, like I said, I'd be happy to do more episodes to talk with other people about this and other issues. So, you know, just let me know. I'll happily, uh, you know, put, you know, try to put more episodes together. So just want to say thank you very much for, for joining me. This has been another episode of International Immersion. Uh, if you, you know, like, like, like he said, anything you can do, you know, spread the word, raise awareness, talk, talk to your friends, family, coworkers about what's going on, see what organizations are out there, donate, uh, you know, join, you know, check on social media, different groups, anything you can do will help. And, you know, and give, you know, people like him and his fellow, you know, fellow citizens uh, the ability to kind of gain back what they, what they want and to be able to prosecute their own, you know, um, destiny in the way they should and not be limited by that so you know and for international immersion i'll link more information about the situation in myanmar in this episode description you can check it out there Uh, if you have any questions thoughts any ideas or anyone else you think we could talk to about this or other issues just send us an email at international immersion podcast at gmail.com check out our facebook page instagram page and our linkedin page as well so with that signing off, we'll be back for more episodes discussing new topics. Our thoughts and prayers go out to um, my guest and his and everyone in Myanmar. And with that, this has been another episode of International Immersion, and we will see you on the next one.